the risk hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the Bloomberg Oz Bond Composite Zero Year Index. Some people would know some ETFs that seek to track the return on this index is Vanguard's VAF and BlackRock's IAF, and it's a fixed interest index engineered to measure the Australian debt market, being a composite of treasury, semi-government, supranational sovereigns uh, that are issuing debt in AUD and credit indices. And the weighted average maturity is 5.9 years at the moment, and it's double A plus rated. So essentially that's the term and credit risk across the index. Your investment philosophy book we wrote available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say our intent is educational and not rendering financial advice. Don't make a step sign. Simple concepts. We'd like investors to better understand performance in the short and long term so they can make informed decisions. A periodic performance. So I've included cash there as a reference point. This is the first time I've actually discussed a fixed interest index. But why hold Australian fixed interest, Peter? Uh, because often the average retail investor simply gravitates to stocks and that's all. Certainly, Daniel. Uh, I think, too, that uh, investors investing in the stock market is a vastly more newsworthy story and media-worthy story because share markets are much more volatile over short periods generally uh, than bond markets. Commenting on the bond markets you know, is often considered just downright boring. What we can see is that people that are prepared to invest in bond markets, if we look at the one through to 25 year numbers, uh, and particularly the, the 20 and 25 year numbers, they earn a premium for buying longer periods of debt than they receive if they just invest in short term lending in the form of cash. The 25 year number there's about a 41 basis points higher return or 0.4 of a percent per annum. At the 20 year number, it's nearly 1% per annum. That's just simply the risk reward trade-off. The longer investors lend their money, the longer the period that's available for the borrower to get into trouble and not pay the debt back. That's why investors that hold longer term bonds get rewarded with the slightly higher return. It's not a lot higher, but it is higher. At the same time, uh, you can see from that top row of figures, we saw a major rise in interest rates in the recent three years, and bond prices fell significantly. As a result, we can see a negative return there. Bonds don't always deliver higher returns than cash, but if they're held for long enough, they will. One other thing I'll just touch on when you said uh, not many people are interested in the bond market compared to the stock market, and you don't generally get reports on that. The size of the, the bond market globally versus equity markets, what's the difference? The uh, global bond market dwarfs the global stock market. You've got countries like Japan, where there is so much government debt, which is owed back to the citizens of Japan. It absolutely dwarfs the Japanese stock market. Like it's just an order of magnitude bigger. Whilst Japan might be at the very extreme end, it's certainly not alone. And across the globe, bond markets are vastly larger in financial value than public equity markets. The growth of wealth looks like a st steady trip north, uh, a little bit more volatile than cash, but there are potential losses there because as we know, as rates increase, the value of existing bonds falls and COVID shows when there was a spike as rates fell and, and then a significant fall as rates increased. This chart's got a couple of uh, salutary lessons in it from my perspective. If you go back towards the left-hand end of the uh, chart, you'll see there's a decline in the green line or a decline in the bond markets back in 1994. Uh, and that resulted from the US Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan telling the markets that he thought they'd become irrationally exuberant. And he promptly drove up uh, bond yields, drove down bond prices, and the share markets went with them at the same time. And then we had bonds starting from a new higher yield price that started to fall, and the line starts to rise again quite healthily. Then we see the global financial crisis starting in 2007 and 8, and governments around the world softened interest rates significantly. So bond prices rose significantly. And we've had a period since then where governments 
have deliberately wanted a low interest rate environment and as a result invoked low interest rate policy over that period. And you can see a generalised increase in the rate of incline in the green line until you hit the period inside the circle where suddenly interest rates actually had to start rising and the bond market fell significantly. Investors that entered the bond markets only around 2020, well, they have had a very unpleasant ride through that period. And range returns, as you say, as some have learned in recent years, bonds can have a negative return. Um, and does require a you know specific set of circumstances where rate rates increase sharply to see that double digit one year return, but still can happen. As the chart shows on the extreme left, the one year result. You know, in 1990, we started off with very high interest rates around the 15% mark. But by the end of 1990, interest rates had fallen to between 10 and 11. And that translated into a major increase in the value of bonds, particularly longer dated bonds out around the sort of 10 year duration period. The flip side of that, of course, was, as you can see there, September 2021, we've just seen interest rates rise by a number of percent in a very short space of time. And the bond running yields before that were only around 4%, and suddenly you've got a significant loss. Important to recognise bonds can lose value. In my career, I'd say I've really seen two major bond market sell-off, the most recent one, and the one back in 1994. They may well have been 30-odd years apart, but they do happen. You can see what you were talking about there, the recent negative returns in fixed interest were greater magnitude. Um, they're not exactly new because I mean, you go back to the mid-90s, and as you say, that's a decent drop back then. Look, I think that this particular chart's effectively got two clearly defined segments. That is the first that starts at the left and finishes around 90. 1995. That was the high interest rate uh, environment. From 1995 onwards, we've been in a low interest rate environment. I think one of the contributors to that is the fact that the developed world governments broadly across the globe have run significant deficit budgets. And as a result, government policy is aimed at keeping interest rates low because as they rack up debt, the less they've got to pay in interest charges, the better it is for the government, the further it is before they have to deal with their debt problems. Negative months in bonds can be as common as stocks. This is a little bit more influenced by recent times, but monthly movements probably aren't as extreme. You might just go into the negative instead of losing 7% in a month or something like that. It's important to recognise that this is a 34-year chart. If we had available data going back to, say, Federation, I think you'd find that the number of negative one-month and three-month figures would reduce if we had a much longer data series. When you get out to five years, you know, there's been just on a quarter of 1% of the five-year periods that you measure actually is a negative return. The largest fall in time to recovery, and this is an interesting one because we're actually still in the midst of it. Australian bond prices recovering from their largest historic fall, which seem to have hit bottom in October 2023. And obviously, we've cut the chart off at the end of 2023. So it's looking a bit better than this currently. To me, this is valuable to be able to observe that, yes, at the moment, for that three years, we're still behind, but that's certainly not enough data upon which to make a decision about the validity of bonds. And it's just just highlighting what, what happened, really. You got to a point where interest rates were so low, and when they had to rise, there was nowhere, nowhere else for bond prices to go but down. And the risk return or efficient frontier, and this is why bonds sit out further on the efficient frontier than cash. Cash, you know, the volatility in the, the price of cash securities is pretty close to zero. And you can see bond price volatilities, you know, out towards the 4% mark. It's only about a third of what equity volatility is. It's ironic that we're looking at it at a period where in that 34 years, you've got two colossal bond market falls. I'd love to see the 124 year numbers because I suspect the volatility would on average be a little bit lower again. But there is volatility in bond markets and investors have to both understand it and accept it because it's that that gives them the premium return that this chart shows is available to them. And sources and descriptions of data. Thanks for your time. Okay, thanks again.